Boom, ba-doom, 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 boom, boom, boom. Toss a coin to your witcher, oh valley of plenty. Hello everybody and welcome back or welcome to my channel. Today we are talking about the witcher, the sword of destiny. Holy guacamole, this book, I'm not going to lie, was an absolute roller coaster ride. By the time I'd finished the second story in this book, I was pretty sure that I was going to hate it. Which really bothered me because I just bought the entire box set of these books. If this book ended after the second story, I would have given it a 2 out of 10. And that's being generous. And I'll go into my massive issues with this book shortly, but after I read the third story, it really elevated this book for me. I then read the next story, and it elevated it even more. And then I read the last story, and it took it from a 2 out of 10 to something much better. And now I cannot wait to read the next one, The Blood of Elves. I'm so glad that I didn't DNF this series after that second story, because after that second story, it was raised from trash to incredible. I'm going to start this review with my massive problems with this book. The problems that almost made me DNF this series. But first I want to address the argument as to whether or not you need to read these two books at all. Because they are not part of the wider series. So a lot of people, if you're unaware, actually skip these two short story books. And they just start with the first book in the series, The Blood of Elves. Now at the time of recording this video, I'm actually 120 pages into The Blood of Elves. And I did this on purpose because I wanted to start this book before I did this review. So I could go into this review and tell you guys whether or not you actually need to read the first two books or not. And the simple answer is no, you do not need to read the first two stories to understand the Blood of Elves book. But I definitely recommend reading the first two stories before you start with Blood of Elves. Because there's so much character history and so much character introductions that you'd miss out on. That it would be a shame to miss those things. It would stop you from enjoying the series because you need to build these characters up in your mind. Whereas if you go into Blood of Elves already knowing everything about these characters, you can just enjoy it from the start. And to really put it into perspective as to what I'm talking about, the first 30 pages of this book are all about Dandelion the Bard. And if you just picked this book up and you didn't know who Dandelion the Bard was, and you just spent the first 30 pages reading about this guy singing songs, you might very well be turned off. Or at the very least, you'd be pretty confused. But not only that, you don't know the relationship between Yennefer and Geralt, or Geralt and Ciri, so you won't be able to appreciate it as much. So are the first two books required reading? No, they're not but you definitely should because you will enjoy the series much more. Now let's get into my massive issues with these books. Firstly, and the biggest issue I had was the domestic abuse in this book. In this book, Geralt is dealt domestic abuse by the hands of Yennefer in physical, mental, and emotional abuse. And you might be sitting there thinking, a lot of books have so much gratuitous violence and torture and rape and all other forms of nasty stuff. Why am I choosing this hill to die on. Why is this hill my fight? Books are meant to show us the evils of humanity. They're meant to show us murderers and abusers and all that other stuff. And you'd be right. You're more than right. The issue, however, with the domestic abuse in this story is how it's framed. The author has written this story in a way that says, because Yennefer is emotionally abusive, is physically abusive, it makes her a strong character. Now, Team, if you're unaware of why that is such a damaging way for an author to write his characters, let me, let me clarify it for you. It does not matter what your gender is, whether you are a man or a woman or somewhere in that spectrum. And it does not matter if your partner is a man, a woman or somewhere on that spectrum. At no point do you have the right to physically, emotionally or mentally abuse them. And if you do not have the mental or emotional capabilities to talk to your partner about your issues, then you do not deserve to be in a relationship. If you encounter an issue with your relationship and the only way you know to solve those issues is to be physically violent or emotionally manipulative, you need to grow as a person before you enter a relationship. Because the simple fact is, if you abuse your partner, that does not make you a strong character. It makes you a piece of shit. And this may sound harsh, 
because I mean it to, because if we don't stand here against this, what are we standing for? Secondly, I want to address the weird sexuality in this book. Now, for the longest time, I never understood the hate that male authors get when they write female characters. Because men and women are different, so it makes sense that men won't be able to write female characters as well as a female author, and vice versa because we have different minds, and so we won't be able to understand the subtle nuances of each other's minds. But after reading this book, I finally understand what all the hate is about. And if you're unsure of what I'm talking about, this meme right here sums it up pretty well. There is such a bizarre focus on the female form in this book, to the point where it is off-putting and creepy. And this was only elevated by the actions of certain people. And for example, there is a point where everyone's on like a road and Yennefer gets tied up. She gets tied to a wagon. And while she's tied up to a wagon, a man comes along and starts groping her and takes her top off and leaves her tied to a wagon with no top on. And whenever Yennefer enters a scene, she always gets like a 10 page essay on her body. Or when any woman does anything in this story, she is very sexually described. Now I haven't checked who the target audience for these books is, but just the way that this sexuality is written, it wouldn't surprise me if this was meant for teenage boys going through puberty. I'm not saying sexuality is a bad thing, but the way the sexuality in this book is written is really weird and kind of rapey. Those are my two massive issues I had with this book. So let's get into the actual review. But before we do, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel. There's a little subscription button down there. I'll wait here for you for just a second. You're all done? All right, thank you very much. Your likes, subscribes, and comments help me out more than you could know. So, thank you once again. So let's start with the plot. The plot was much better in this book than it was in the last one. And I found myself enjoying these stories much more. I found that they were much better thought out and the plot twists in them were less predictable. But most importantly, I found each story concluded in a much more satisfying way. I'm not going to tell you which stories are the best stories, but there were a few times that after I finished a story, I just had to close the book and just go, wow, and just meditate on what I just read. And honestly, isn't that the best feeling when you're reading a book? I did also much more prefer the way that this book was laid out because the first book had a central story and then all the short stories branched off of it. With this one, it was just set stories, beginning and end, there was no central plot line in it. And in my opinion, that is the preferred way to do it. Although in saying that, I will say that going into this book, I didn't realize that it was set out different to the first one. So during the first story, I was expecting at any point these people would sit down at a campfire or they'd sit down at a table or they would be on horseback and then they would start telling these short stories. It wasn't until about halfway through the first story that I realized that this wasn't about to branch off into other short stories. This was the short story. And I feel as if, if I knew from the start that these were all individual short stories, I would have enjoyed the book more, which is why I'm telling you this now. Go into it knowing that the short stories start from the beginning. There is no setup for it. Overall, the plot of this book is fantastic. As much as I would like to go more into it, I won't because I don't want to spoil it for you. I'm not even going to tell you which was my favorite stories or which was my favorite parts because I want you to go in blind and just be as wowed as I was. That brings us on to characters. Now, I want to start the character section by talking about character motivations. Now, whenever I give advice about writing characters, one of the biggest points that I stress more than anything to write three dimensional characters is to give your character a good, believable motivation. Because people just don't randomly do the things that they do. People do the things that they do for a reason. Whether it is they're moving towards a goal, they're moving away from something, or something has happened to them. And I feel as if this book really shows how basic a character's motivation can be, yet still be compelling and engaging. Because Although Geralt as a character is struggling with his humanity, what it means to be a witcher and a mutant, and is he still human? Can he feel things? And the whole issue with him and his destiny, and does he believe in destiny? Despite all that that's going on, none of that is his character motivation. His character motivation is so simply that he was given a set of skills that 
allows him to survive into the world and make money. Just like any other worker out there in the world, just like a miner or a farmer or whatever. He just has to go where the work is. And the interesting thing is you'd expect a witcher that kills these unkillable monsters to get paid a significant amount of money for doing that job. But he really only gets paid enough money to get him to his next job. And that's how the author keeps the character motivated by having his rewards be so meager, but having him still pursue that as his only option. And further to that, you have Dandelion, who just wants to be the best bard in the world. That's his whole character motivation. But to do that, he needs to see both the beauty and the tragedy of the world. And he does that by traveling, putting himself into dangerous situations with Geralt and meeting people all around the world. The author did a really good job of laying out the character's motivations and just showing how simple and effective character motivations can be. Now let's talk about Geralt. Geralt is a fantastic character. He started this book much the way he ended the last one, but he experienced growth in this book related around the mindset of destiny. And he's continued to be a thoughtful character in this, where he tries to avoid violent solutions to problems. He tries to talk people out of things and he sticks to his ethics. By the end of this book, I am still a fan of Geralt's and I am a very big fan of how he interacts with Ciri in this book. Dandelion. The interesting thing about Dandelion is he is still the same two-dimensional character from the first book. He likes women, women like him, he runs away from women. Like I said in my last video, this character has a lot of potential to do something big. And although he didn't do anything big in this story, he did do one particular thing that will stay with me for a very long time, and that was what happened in the short story, A Little Sacrifice. When you read it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Like I said, I hope they're planning on doing something really big with Dandelion. I'm hoping he's not just a comic relief character that's just gonna die for a little bit of shock value, but I don't imagine that that's what's gonna happen. I imagine that he is going to live and write an epic ballad. I imagine that's what's going to happen, but I hope he does something great because his character is set up for exponential growth and heroism. Maybe he does something fantastic and everybody writes ballads about him. I don't know, but I am really excited and I hope that they give this guy extra dimension further along in the series. Yennefer. Now, like I said at the start, I've got mixed feelings about Yennefer right now, but moving forward, I'm planning on just ignoring the domestic abuse thing that Yennefer was involved with because I feel as if that was a error of the author. He was just trying to say, this character is strong. So I'm going to pretend that whole nastiness never happened and just take what the author was trying to say and that she is a strong woman. And with that in mind, I actually quite like Yennefer. And I think a great example of how strong and independent she is, is at some point there's two men fighting over her and I hate love triangles. So when I saw it, I just groaned. But the way that she solved this love triangle was Fantastic, and it's the way I think all love triangles should be solved. So I was pretty impressed with that. I find it really weird that the author is putting such a massive emphasis on the fact that Yennefer can't have kids. So I'm wondering if that is some kind of foreshadowing to some kind of mother-daughter relationship with Ciri, or if there's some kind of cultural thing where this author is from that I'm just unaware of. And that leads me on to Ciri. I like Siri a lot. I think she is great and I like the relationship between her and Geralt. I was honestly a little concerned with one specific line in the book that made me think that they might have a romantic relationship a little bit down the road and given how weird the sexuality in this book is I was legitimately concerned about that but now that I've started reading the Blood of Elves, I am pretty sure that that is not the case. So I am happily mistaken about that. I like Ciri when she came into the story, I like Ciri at the end of the story, and I'm looking forward to what happens to her in the future. I'm really hoping that with Ciri it's going to be like the Harry Potter novels where you get to like watch her grow and watch her train and watch her become this great person. World building. If you watched my last video on The Last Wish, you would remember that I said that the issue with this book was there was literally zero world building in it. I am pleased, however, to inform you that in this book, there is significantly more world building. There isn't the same world building that you'd expect with a regular fantasy novel, but it is a significant improvement over the first book. None of the world building felt unneeded or tedious. It all felt good. And in all honesty, with how much 
tedious sitting around and talking there is in this story, the more faster paced world building felt really good because if there was slow world building and the tedious conversations in the book, then this would have felt like a chore and it would have dragged along. So I think it was a really good balance. Let's get into my final thoughts and what I would rate this. The characters are still the thing that is carrying this series for me. Yennefer, Geralt, Dandelion, Ciri. All fantastic characters. Like I always say, great characters can carry a bland plot. In this case, it's great characters carrying a good plot. And even a lot of the supporting characters are pretty great to be around. The magic system, however, still has very little information around it. I still don't have a mental image as to how they make the signs with their fingers to create magic. I might Google a picture of it or maybe a video of some gameplay just to finally see what it looks like when they use the magic. But I imagine as the series progresses, there will probably be more of an emphasis on magic and they might go into a bit more depth as to who can use it, why they can use it, how it feels to use it, is their limitations. Now when it comes to rating this book, it is clearly a mixed bag because I would say that it is definitely better than the first book. The writing style is better, the characters are better, the stories themselves are better and they end in such a fantastic way. The author definitely grew as a writer when he was writing this book. However, the glaring issues I talked about really bring this book down for me. And the domestic abuse thing only happened in one story and I can see past that because like I said, it was a mistake of the author thinking that he was saying that this woman is strong because of it and this book was written 27 years ago so maybe at the time that was the general consensus but more than that the weird sexuality of this book was in every story and it really dragged it down for me so I would be hesitant although I think it is superior to the last book I'd be hesitant to rate it above it so I'm going to give it the exact same score 7 out of 10. I definitely recommend reading it. It is a great book. Read both of the sets of short stories before you start The Blood of Elves because you'll enjoy it more. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, comment any comments you have down below. I'll read them all and more than likely respond. And as always, thank you very much.